I'm going to give you a little bit of inspiration about how you really start to vision a community and then probably more than you ever wanted to know about how you go about it. I'll just start talking while Mark is Thank messing. You. And uh, you think about what our goal is for visioning a new vision for a community with the age and history that we have in Beaver County. Uh, one of the things that you think about is, are we planning to be just the modern iteration of the old way, or are we looking at going forward in a way that we can sustain for five, six, seven generations forward from here? Okay. Okay, there you go. And this, I'm just going to do around. this. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So, so I think I wanted to remind us of the sustainability goals that were adopted by the Brundtland Commission. Now, a lot of people have sustainability definitions, and they talk about what it means, and academicians debate it back and forth. But I really think this is one of the simplest statements of what sustainability is that captures the concept fully, that we plan for meeting our own needs today without compromising the capacity for future generations to meet their needs. And it's very much a concept of investing some of our intellectual capital today to plan forward for our children, for our grandchildren, and their grandchildren. So it's a very much an altruistic thought forward when you're doing a community plan. You're not doing it for the people that are sitting in the room. You're doing it for their great-grandchildren. And that's what a visioning process really should be, to look at how we can preserve this fragile earth life support system for the next generation. And it's an ethical challenge, more than a technical challenge, to evaluate our concept of need so that we are not in a nature of needing five and a half planets in order to meet it going forward, and to evaluate our responsibilities to the future generation. I don't know how many of you come from immigrant families you have parents or grandparents who came here from another country, and how much they had to sacrifice to get us here. I'm first generation Italian, and I know my family has stories and stories of sacrifice that we really have to think about. What are we doing to invest in the next generation? And also, every other thing that we share the planet with has the right to exist. The living creatures that we share in this community what are we doing to make this a healthy habitat for all of the living creatures that live in Beaver County? And then what are the responsibility of corporations as well as governments? Because freedom without responsibility will yield you chaos every time. And we need to understand the unintended consequences of our, of our choices. And that is sometimes the hardest thing to do because you're so focused on the immediate benefit and the immediate glamour of a situation. Oh, we're getting 600 jobs. There are going to be 3,000 construction jobs. And then what? Then what happens? So we need to ask those then what's and think about whether we can abate that or change it or choose a different direction. And understand that we're all connected. We share more in our common humanity, even with people we disagree with the most in our own community, share a common love for our children, a hope for a better future. We strive for peace and we all deserve justice. We are a lot more connected as fellow human creatures than we are as them and us. And we are also connected globally. Uh, our supply chains of the things we use every day come from all around the globe. If you look just where your jacket was made and where you know, things that you use every day come from. Nobody thinks about that much. But if you do think about it, and then think about the fate of the things you throw out, where do they go? What happens to them? Then we start thinking about the interconnectedness, not just of our own community, but all the communities around us. And plastic has become the scourge of the earth as a global pollutant. There are 200 and 50 ocean species that are known to be killed or entangled in plastic waste, and 10 to 20 million tons of plastic refuse ends up in the oceans. Do we really need a plant that is going to make plastic, a non-recyclable, non-regenerative material that we're going to add to this burden? And we discard so much of it without being responsible about how we do that. 
40% of the plastic we throw away comes from packaging, and that is what they're planning to make at this cracker plant. So it's also a huge source of emissions, and you know this data, you've seen these numbers many times, but to think about this, when you're doing a visioning statement in a plan, you have to think about, is this really what we want for our community? And if it isn't, what do we do instead? And it's a transition time, and transitions are always messy. Um, the fossil fuel economy is not going to go without a fight, but the sustainable economy that is emerging is a brighter, better future for everybody. We have to move away from the extractive industries that turn things from raw material to trash to a more circular concept of an economy where the raw materials are reclaimed, reused, repurposed, and goes around. There are three quarters of that economic circle that we're not using because we throw the raw material away after one transition. Not effective, not efficient, not economic at all. And certainly, if we're planning a better way forward, we have better options. So they promoted Marcella Shale to us as bridge fuel, the energy game changer, only the beginning. I mean, you can hear the Allegheny Conference tout this stuff from the rafters, and they you know, are willing to throw a lot of billions of dollars to bring this industry here. And they say, oh, our energy prices are 40% lower because of Marcella Shale until they finish the pipeline, and then everybody else is going to get the cheap stuff and our prices are going to go up. But they don't tell you that part. You have to look that up yourself. So we need to start designing system solutions and looking for the pillar on the other side of that bridge to look for what the options are for building a more resilient and sustainable community and start building our vision statements around that. When you did a transition from the horse and buggy to the car, we spent a lot of time evolving the rules of the road. We licensed the vehicles so we had you know, a way to keep track of the drivers. We paved the roads. We taxed people and had driver's licenses so we could pay for the paving. We invented a whole fuel supply chain. We haven't done any of that for the circular economy. We haven't done any of that for the alternative energy economy. We're struggling along one piece at a time. We need to understand that our entire economy is built on the concept of throwing things once through from raw material to trash based on consumption. When consumers decide to get cautious about what they're buying, it's an economic crisis. Consumer confidence is down. Retail sales are down. This is a tragedy. Really? What about building things that last a generation, that you hand on to your children? What about thinking about what you're going to do with things before you buy them just to throw away? And we have obstacles to making these changes, of course. Limited consensus and having people, even though a large part of the population believes that climate change is a serious problem, Congress continues to not act. If you support the Clean Power Plan because you care about your grandchildren, that is 69% of the population, but only 30% of Congress. So we need to make some adjustments. And they argue that, you know, renewable energy is so subsidized. Well, it really isn't. This is the federal uh, energy incentive subsidies. Um, and you can see that we've had 7.2 billion annual fossil fuel industry subsidies, and renewables are much, much less, 12%, 2%. It isn't anywhere near the size of subsidies that we're putting into fossil fuels and nuclear. So when they argue that it only survives because there's subsidies to the solar, that isn't the case. These subsidies to the fossil industry and nuclear energy are hard-baked into the law, and some of them go back to the 1800s. So we need to really look at whether we should be removing these subsidies and are your grandchildren worth the fight that it will take to do that. So you remember we're coming up on the anniversary of the Donora smog event of 1948. How many of you remember that? Not too many of you. But that event was really caused by the kind of weather inversions that you get at this time of year in the hills of Pennsylvania and the Emissions from the zinc and power factories that were in the valley were so toxic that they had 15 people die. Eventually, 23 people died you know, from their um, exposure. And if you 
fall for the for the word that if you're going to have jobs, you're going to have environmental impact. That's just the way it is. Remember, Leo Girard, who was the CEO of the Steelworkers, AFL-CIO Steelworkers, he said, we reject the notion that we have to choose between good jobs and a clean environment. We need to have both or we will have neither. And that is, I think, the kind of framing that you need to do to have a vision forward. That just because we can adopt technology to continue extracting things from increasingly difficult places from the depths of the earth doesn't mean that we should. We have to have the wisdom to say, this isn't one that's going to work going forward. This is part of the past. And demand accountability for those who insist on retaining a focus on the fossil past. So we can do things personally in your life, and we can also work on putting systems together that go forward. And as we drive for better options, we need to have a firm conviction that it is much more efficient, effective, and cost-effective to go forward in a way that is building for the future than regenerating and holding up and propping up the ways of the past. The net zero hierarchy in energy, waste, and water has been adopted by the US military. It was not rescinded by Trump because he doesn't know it exists. But the generals <laughs> have adopted this approach because it is a force multiplier. When you reduce the resources that you need, you're less vulnerable to disruption. You repurpose things that you have because that's more cost efficient. You recycle and compost because you're recapturing the resources that have already been invested. And you do energy recovery. And only in, when you can't do any of those do you use raw material from the beginning. So this kind of an approach, it works, it works for the military. Any of you who've been in the military on a base where this is practiced, understand how it just infuses into the whole system. This is the way you can look at your community requirements. You look at your energy, water, and waste streams and try to figure out how do we waste as little as possible, reuse as much as possible, and look at regenerating the resources that we rely on. Creating solutions means that you have a pillar on the other side of that bridge. If you don't, you just have a gangplank into a river full of alligators. You need to design and plan for a sustainable endpoint and start to visualize what that will look like. We have four clusters already identified through this early stage process to begin with. And I think that's a sound point for departure for further discussion and sharpening. So sharpen up. What is your goal? What do we want this county to be? whether or not the cracker plant thinks it gets itself built. If you have a strong, sharp vision of what can happen instead, it's going to be more than 600 jobs. It's going to be more sustainable, more resilient, and it's going to last for generations, not 20 years. So I have about 10 steps here, and I'm leaving this with uh, Heather so that you can all have this on your slides. This comes from the Conference of Mayors Sustainability Planning. And uh, we're going to do probably just the first or second step tonight. But you need to build a positive vision. And you start with a high-level sustainability planning group. While well, you're calling them a stakeholders group. Uh, that represents all the significant sectors in the community. And you do a sharing of values. To address all the important aspects, you've already identified four subgroups where you want to work on things. Um, and then you need to start getting feedback. You should be having a community meeting next and say, OK, this is our draft vision and four areas that we'd like to develop a sustainable plan. What do you think? Did we miss one? Is there something more important that we have to add? How are we dealing with this? And is this the right thing? We need to do some feedback. And you need to invest directly in local people. You know, plan for job training, job placement, good public schools and connections to higher education and trade education. And invest in the community itself. Money that goes into a plant where the corporate headquarters is in another country, where most of the high paid workers are in another state, is not putting investment into your community. You need to articulate the kinds of things that if you put investment, imagine what you could do with a $6.1 billion investment in Beaver County. Think about it. Start developing an alternative fate for that money. 
and think about what would happen if you had that kind of resource for the kinds of things that you have on the table in front of you. Clean air, clean water are significant economic assets. If you undertake something that's going to compromise those basic assets that you already have, the beauty of your landscape, the wonderfulness of your own little town areas, these kinds of things can be lost in a heartbeat. Go down to Ryerson Station Park and see what happens, you know, when you allow an industry to just take over. And using a land use plan has to be part of your vision. You know, what are the critical things that you have to permanently protect? The farmland, open space, any unique features of the community, these are the things you should focus on because these are the things that are irreplaceable and priceless and evaluate any development plan that you make for its effect on the connectedness of the community. If you're putting something in that's gonna create barricades and economic barriers, that isn't gonna help you. And there are some things you can do about this. I'm running out of time already and I haven't even... <laughs> okay, um, good information, uh, compiling and sharing natural resource inventories, forecasts, and disseminate that information widely in a way that can be shared and evaluated. So when you put out your vision and your four strategy areas, how are you gonna measure progress in those areas? What are you finding out? And we're gonna do a SWOT analysis in a minute that will help you get some of that. And you know what measures, what's get measured gets done. So come up with some metrics of progress that everybody understands. Uh, when we were doing energy efficiency in buildings in Cheshire, Connecticut, um, we had the high school kids do thermometers on each building and they would put their energy bill on it every month with a target of where they wanted them to be. It was really effective because people coming in could see right away, oh, here's our goal, here's where we are, yow. You know? And it, just what kind of metric are you going to use that's visual and effective for people to understand? And thinking long range, um, looking forward as much as possible and encouraging uh, a net zero plan. Um, we just did a net zero energy for building for our borough in Forest Hills. And that was a tough call. I mean, we had a lot of people saying there's nothing wrong with the old building, 1922 repurposed fire station, not compliant with code in many, many ways, but there's no way to fix it by infusing more and more money into it. So when you say we're gonna build a new one, why not build a net zero energy renewable resource to building as a centerpiece of our town? And it's going to be that. So you need to look for the goals in all sectors and then use incentives and regulations at the borough level or at the, at the county level in order to do that. Um, Remade in the USA is a good place to look for examples. Watch out for walkable communities having places where people can get to work and get to recreational areas without having to get on the parkway or in the highway or in their car, making little mini neighborhoods that are self-sufficient and re rewarding to people. And preserve the unique features of your neighborhood and enhance them. These are things that are the features that people will recognize you by, things that you wanna celebrate, things that will be here when you're not here anymore, the features of your landscape, the features of your town that are permanent. And recognize that there are limits to growth. Uh, endless growth is not always successful. You have a succession of things, even in nature, you don't get endless growth. So what is the state of being that you're trying to capture? not a state of having, but the experience of living in this community. What are the experiences that you have as you work and live and play in this space? And look at ways that support natural habitats as part of your own community so that you're sustained and supported by the natural world around you. So we can design communities that allow us to live in harmony with nature, not in a struggle against it. And having a sustainable system, a resilient community will be much preferable to one that has a spotlight of wealth where the wealth mostly leaves the town. Okay, I've given some resources for this and uh, I think we're about to choose our legacy for this earth and for this community. And we have to think about our great-grandchildren and their grandchildren 
and they deserve a healthy, sustainable world. So I will be joining you at your tables um, as we talk about a SWOT analysis. Um, and that means you look at the strengths. You have your four subject areas, right? You will look at what are the strengths in those areas? What are the weaknesses? What are, what are the things that you see as uh, opportunities? And what are the challenges or threats that you face in putting that forward? And just start to think about those four things in order, and then you can start developing an action plan around that, because that will give you an idea of your benefits and your costs. Okay? Thank you very much. I, I do. Okay, well, let's start with Joanne. So my question is, we in this county have an existing structure for community planning or economic and development planning. And we're at this very beginning stage. My question is, do, how do we find our way to the existing structure? That's part A of the question. And part B is, if we don't find our way, then what's the alternative path? Is that mm -hmm. a clear enough question? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, please. Okay, we, um, every comprehensive plan in a community needs to be updated within a certain period. So the first thing you need to do is find out how close you are to the next round. And if you're not close, then you need to make an argument to your planning commission or whoever they are called about why changes in circumstances in the community would justify a re-examination of the comprehensive plan. And especially if you go to that kind of a meeting with this kind of input from stakeholder visioning and um, you know four categories of development identified already, then you've already gone to them with some fodder for further action. And I would make a big deal out of it. I mean, make a public you know bring make sure the room is full when you bring this forward. You know, don't go there with yourself and your brother. You know. Um, go with a, a room full of people who are saying, yes, there are changes in our community that are going to affect the nature of our community forward. We have opinions about that. We have alternative plans about that. We would like to have a forum to discuss it. If they turn you down, then that becomes a press event, and you use that as a focus for organizing. Just a little bit further to what Pat said. These uh, comprehensive plans are done both at the local level, but they're also done at the county level. And they are, in essence, public meetings. Right. So that means that they have to have a meeting in the public, and they have to give you an opportunity to talk. And everything you present becomes a part of the official record. Uh, so as Patty said, come well prepared, bring your crew. And, um, but you need to find out what the agenda is, you need to find out when they're going to have the various hearings that your comments are going to be appropriate because there, it's actually um, a six, maybe a six month process to come up with a comprehensive plan review and there are certain points. But the person who's responsible for the plan is able to tell you that information. So you have to contact who they are. Yes. I'd like to question, I'm not from Beaver, uh, but I think it would behoove us all to look at what the current or last comprehensive plan was or is now uh, based on the 2010 census because we have three years for the next comprehensive plan. And so maybe we should take a look at what that was. Are we meeting those goals or did we insert something that shouldn't have been there in the first place, mm -hmm. and then move forward with that. Mm -hmm. I think Patty would also agree that you ought to take a good look at your current comprehensive plan, um, because uh, and determine what the cycle is and when the next ones are coming up, but basically to find out what's there. Because if there's something in the plan that you're supporting and it's not getting done, you've got a very strong case. Yeah. However, they'll tell you that it's a plan it's not a commitment in the sense that it isn't in the budget and there's not necessarily, because it's in the plan, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna happen. It's an advisory kind of a document. Um, one of the successful things that I've seen communities do is make 
uh, their local planning commissions and commissioners and legislative personnel partners mm -hmm. and not opponents. So uh, mm -hmm. Johnstown, for example, one of the big priorities of the community at the beginning of its visioning process was that neighborhood planning was not really being done effectively. Um, neighborhoods had no central governance structure by which they could um, work to solve challenges related to blight and economic development and whatever. So they approached the commissioners at the onset, the Cambria County Commissioners um, and the Planning Commission of Cambria County. And now, a couple years later, the Planning Commission is actively working as a partner within Vision 2025 to do neighborhood planning and to solve some of those problems. So it's a little bit uh, below the comprehensive plan mm -hmm. level, but it's, it's a way to insert into uh, decision making. Next question. Yes, ma'am. You had mentioned offering mini grants. What was the infrastructure set up for that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so Repeat the question. The question was, uh, in my presentation about vision, uh, we have a mini grant program set up. And so what is the uh, mechanism and structure and infrastructure for the mini grant program? Uh, really good question. And we borrowed this from the Sprout Fund in Pittsburgh, actually, who also do mini grants. So you might want to connect to those folks. Um, so uh, one of my funders in Johnstown uh, that pays for vision stuff is the Community Foundation for the Alleghenies, which has a footprint of, I think, five or six counties in south central Pennsylvania. Um, active partner that funds other vision stuff. So they were really interested in doing these capture awards to begin with. So they set up a fund, $25,000 as seed money, and that can get us um, awards of 500 or $1,000, uh, distributed the check to us, and then we set up an application process that capture teams can submit the award, it goes through a judging committee, and if approved, they get 500 or $1,000. Meant to be quick, painless, effortless, not meant to be a whole lot of paperwork and that kind of stuff. Um, start up cash for projects. Does that answer your question? Okay. Did they get you the whole amount? Yes, so it, the way it was set up, the foundation granted us $25,000 with uh, stipulations that we then can distribute the awards to wherever. And what kind of fund did you put in so that it won't get relocated anywhere else? Um, that is just in, um, it's the way where it's it's in a nonprofit fund that works with us. So they have it set aside and they're fairly accountable for that kind of stuff. Right. We did, yes. Happy to answer any other questions about that. Uh, as well. No, that's fine. Uh, saw a hand back behind you somewhere. Yes. Um, has there been a community in Pennsylvania that has run off uh, entirely renewable energy? Has there been a community in Pennsylvania that has run off 100% renewable energy? Is that feasible yet? Um, I know that some have made commitments. Um, uh, Pittsburgh has, for example. And I know a number of other communities have adopted uh, uh, being in the Paris Accord. Uh, we're going to be voting on that in my town in November. Um, but our state uh, public utility commission is pretty hostile to the concept. And uh, for example, they're looking at rescinding net metering or limiting it severely in our, in our state, which would be really horrendous. Um, so we have a, a way to go before that happens. It isn't physically a problem. It is a legal and um, social infrastructure problem. It is not a physical problem because we have more sunlight here than Germany or the Netherlands, and both of them are close to 100% renewable in many ways. So uh, I think if a community decided to go 100% renewable and made a commitment to do that, say by 2030, it is doable. Um, there it there just, are actually some towns yeah. in the United States that are... There are many in the United States. You can go to the uh, 100 Resilient Cities um, under the uh, Pew um, Charitable Trust. There's uh, 100 Resilient Cities, and now there are thousands of them where they've made commitments and have plans posted and so forth. Um, but in Pennsylvania, I don't think we have any yet. We have some that have made a commitment but haven't got there yet. Locally, Manaka is making strides with yeah. sustainable... Manaka is when uh, Aspenwall has made a commitment, um, City of Pittsburgh, Sharpsburg, yeah. Etna. You know, 
just to further that along, I think it's a very appropriate question when you are considering candidates to elect in November and also the ones you're going to be looking at in the primary season next year. Ask them if they're willing to step up to this in the state to eliminate these obstacles mm -hmm. that are just legal structures preventing us from moving in this direction. Yes. My borough doesn't really promote transparency for their borough meetings. They put the agendas out sort of not in a timely way, and then they don't post their minutes on the website. The only way to know what's going on is to actually show up, which isn't convenient for people. So no, one's know, no one knows what's really going on. And that's not just the borough council meetings, it's the planning commission. Is there a law, I'm not from Pennsylvania, is there a law that I can throw at them and say you're violating? Mm -hmm. I mean, because yeah. they, they need to turn that around and I've complained oh, not, but I'm really losing patience. Mm -hmm. there, do you want to take it? there is a law, I don't know the citation exactly right now. Uh, Heather, do you know it, the mm -hmm. open meetings law? No. No, but you're right. There is, there there is, is an is. open meetings law in Pennsylvania. I can get you the citation if you need it. but. Uh, you need to have somebody go to the meetings and then post just the topics that were discussed on like on a Facebook page uh, like we have indivisible forest hills they've started showing up at all the meetings they have you know some 50 members somebody is always at every meeting and just show a presence and ask questions and the people who are elected to represent you go to them and complain you know, you have to have a way to reach them. You know who they are. They run for election. So track them down and say, hey, we have no idea what you guys are doing. How come? You know, and demand that they be accountable and keep track of whether they say yes or no that they'll help you. If they decide not to help you, find some people to run against them. It's that easy. I mean, you have to demand accountability. They're supposed to be representing you. If they're representing some closed circle of good old guys, you know, that isn't acceptable, and it isn't legal either. Uh, your, it's a there's a sunshine. Your Open borough meetings. charter might also have some information that you could look into. Yeah. Uh, what else? <laughs> Question. Um, large companies can often set an agenda and fill a room with paid employees, mm -hmm. and they can do a lot of research with paid employees. But a lot of times citizen groups have to rely on volunteers, mm -hmm. like hordes of volunteers, to make up the gap that could be provided by a handful of very well-paid full-time employees. I wonder if you had any strategies for not necessarily how to directly <laughs> contradict that, but how to undermine its power <laughs> or to, you know, what's the guerrilla tactic in response to full force of paid employees pushing an agenda? <laughs> Well, I can, I can show you some scars. <laughs> the, um, you, I mentioned the obstacles in my presentation that you have to uh, overcome, and it depends a great deal on the nature of the project. Um, one example that I was familiar with in Upper St. Clair was an effort to provide a community and recreation center, and we're talking about one that's equivalent to what your kids are going to when they go to college. There, there are these buildings that have gyms and swimming pools, exercise equipment, meeting rooms, craft rooms, and all of these kind of things. It's what the kids today are coming out of college used to, and when they're selecting residential communities, that's what they want to see. There's a, we found in Upper St. Clair that uh, the, the population was not in tune with this. Uh, they, they thought that the country club actually provided all of those needs, and if you weren't a member of the club, too bad. So we, we found that there was opposition coming from that vested interest. Now, it isn't a corporation in this point of view, but it is a funded corporation, and they fought the, the concept of the municipality providing something as good as their facility to all the people and the residents. So what it, whatever it is, you have to be very sensitive to the sources and frankly, if you're in a corporate situation and the corporation is sending out its employees, don't sit there, make a real point of going into the public meeting and saying, look, I want to know how many people are here because they're residents. And I want to know how many of you, put your hands up, if you work for Shell. 
and really make a public case of embarrassment or, or just transparency. Because once they have to stand up and say that they don't, they're not residents, first of all, they can't speak. So they have no voice in that meeting. They're not residents. They may not know that. Their citizens may not know that. But you can tell them. So that means that the people in the room who are the residents are the ones that the electeds have to talk to. And they will discount the fact that now that they know that there are scabs at the room. <laughs> Um, so, very um, directly, mm -hmm. getting to the elephant in the room, since you mentioned Shell. Yes. Shell, Are they the elephant? Yeah. <laughs> Shell now sits on the, the CED, the Corporation for Economic Development in Beaver County. It has never been done before when a private industry has sat on the planning board. They are there now. So, what I'm hearing from you is like a good next step would be to put together you know, a bit of a plan um, and go to the planning commission with what our vision is for the county, our request, our, you know, our, our citizen group demands, so to speak, but I don't want to use that word. Mm -hmm. And how do we then navigate that, that relationship that Shell sits on? Any thoughts? Well, the Corporation for Economic Development is not an elected body. So no. you have your elected bodies that you need to go to and say, we okay. are not supportive of this because we have other ideas that need to be heard too. And you have also the forum of public opinion. Um, you have to be active on social media and on the press. And that's why making a big deal out of meetings like this, saying we've done a visioning, do a summary of it, make sure it gets in the paper, uh, begin to gather um, some of the facts, uh, get an intern from someplace, Duquesne or CMU, that can help you do the business documentation for these four strategies that you've outlined here, and start putting it out as you know newsworthy alternative plans. And I would label it as such. We have a need for a broader than one industry town. You can start there. And the industries that we see as more resilient, more sustainable, and more efficient are going to be with us longer. And just start building the alternate case in the press. And that touches on marketing, yeah. which yeah. we didn't really get too deep into. But marketing is is like really, really key to any of this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Without a solid marketing plan and you know budget and staff and all that kind of stuff, Nobody's hearing the conversations that are happening in rooms like this. Um, and I can't undersell how truly critical that is. I agree. Question? I just had a yeah, quick question in regards to Shell being on. You said they were on the Corporation for Economic Development, she yeah. said. Is that not a conflict of interest? Is that permitted in that venue that they could be on that? It's they, not illegal. It's not. It's just never been done. Right. Hmm. And there was a vote taken. And who, who was the voting first? The entire um, CED. They all voted. How many people? To have show. To have show. Yeah. There were, there, I know there was at least one dissenter. Interesting. So it's almost like they view it as a fait accompli. Therefore, the one is for it. Well, it's. There was a question there. Mm -hmm. I just had a comment. Uh, is there any way that Beaver County is engaging the you know, two groups? Uh, everybody here seems fairly like-minded. And then you got other folks that are interested in the traditional uh, energy sources, such as what the Shell Plant would provide. Um, doing the exercises we did tonight are great. I mean, how do we get people on kind of both sides doing these kinds of SWAT activities and this kind of brainstorming together to help bridge that understanding Do you want to take that on both sides. Yeah, I can contribute some thoughts to that, but I'd love to hear. Yeah. Um, Non-committal discussion. So open forums like this where you make it clear that we're not inviting you to attack you or to push our agenda. We want to present ideas and we want to hear ideas from um, alternative points of view. And there's there's a whole process behind that and a whole methodology that goes into that kind of stuff. 
But uh, conversations like that that can get heated usually require a facilitator that's pretty skilled at that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there's an upfront portion of the meeting that says we're going to check egos at the door and we're going to work for the betterment of our community. And then you go through the process, whatever activities that looks like. Yeah, we did um, a number of open community dialogues about the new borough building. And there were people adamantly committed to keeping the 1922 firehouse and reinvesting and refurbishing. They had, you know, a great deal of commitment to that structure. And there were other people who felt that moving it up to Greensburg Pike was too far out of the center of town, that nobody would be able to get there, that it's too close to Chalfont, that it wasn't really in Forest Hills, and there were all those kinds of detractors. But we started with looking at the purpose. What would we want to have a new borough building have in it? And we talked about what are the functions that we want to have served. Well, you've already got a whole bunch of functions that you would like to see in your community going forward. And then start evaluating, well, what are the possibilities for refurbishing the existing building to do that? There was no way. I mean, you could film a 1920s uh, gangster movie in our police station, and it would be period appropriate today. Okay, I, with no change in the scenery. So, I mean, we know we have some limitations with this sort of thing that could not be fixed with no matter what investment you put there. So people began to see the possibilities of doing a new building. Then, do we tear down the old building and put the new building in that location, or do we put it on a site that the town owns? And we just did a cost comparison, it was a no-brainer. So I think when you can have a dialogue about, we would like to visualize what our community is going to be like for our children's grandchildren. What kind of a community do we want in 50 years, and how do we get there from where we are, then you can start sifting through these kinds of things and look at the unintended consequences of the decisions that are contemplated. Because if you're looking at having a petrochemical industry base in southwestern Pennsylvania and western Pennsylvania going into Ohio, you're going to import what we know happened in Texas, in Louisiana, because they're making no plans to have it have any different fate. Mm -hmm. They're not planning the closed cycle, closed system kind of a plant that they would put if they were building it in their own country. They're putting up the kind of thing they would put in Singapore or Nigeria, mm -hmm. and we've let them. The consequences of that are not good for your grandchildren. So you can sift through those kinds of things. Not pressed in anything to yeah. I'm sorry, I get very passionate about this. I apologize. <laughs> thank I think we, I think you, we share your, your passion, uh, Pat. What I would suggest is, is that the, the Shell plan, it, it's not an either or. You don't have to defeat Shell to do all the other things. The issue is you have to be showing a real achievements in other things that you're doing. So behind us, there are all kinds of good ideas. I happen to be at the table that said they want a vision which is 100% fossil free fuel in 2050 or 40 or something, okay? They set a goal, okay. There's nothing to prevent a sub piece of that to start working which might be to um, put solar building, solar panels on all the flat roofs in Beaver County by such, such and such a date, whatever that goal is. You can do that. You can have your committee, you can have your goal setting, you can go to work, you can make that happen. It doesn't take shawl. The pro what you would achieve is the comparison and the contrasting. Here's a group of citizens who have a vision for an entirely different Beaver County than Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this is what we're doing and we're, this is a demonstration We've, we've taken this block of houses, we've made them energy free, uh, that is fossil fuel free. And this block of houses is beautiful. It doesn't cost those residents anything for fueling those houses, heating and air conditioning and all their other power. And you've made it now, you've made it, a, you've put your vision into reality and you can point to it. That stuff catches on. What's amazing in Pennsylvania, when you consider that our state is anti, is very pro-fossil fuel and anti-renewables, in spite of that, 
we produce more jobs in the renewable energy field by far than what we have in fossil fuel. And, this, and you have the shell plant, 600 jobs, Ugh. okay? You've, you've, the con comparisons are really there. But what the world needs and what the newspapers need and what your fellow citizens need are something to point to with pride and say, yeah, it's possible. So I don't think you have to wait for Shell to get be out of the way. You don't have to be concerned that they seem to be winning. Go out and win our own battles. Thank you. That was, I think that was a really great um, <laughs> statement. It is 8.30, and uh, I want to thank um, Preston and Ryan and Patty for sharing your insights and wisdom with us. Uh, I feel like we really um, have a clear path, uh, a way to go forward, and we have a lot of will and a lot of ideas.